The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning. It's nice to welcome you to our service of worship this morning. A special welcome to all those who are visiting with us from all over Canada. Um, special uh, welcome to people from First Church and from uh, Westmount Presbyterian Church this morning. Thank you to all those who are continuing to support us. And uh, I know some of you starting to get anxious about when we're opening up the church. And uh, you're going to have to be patient. So many of our people uh, are seniors and vulnerable. And uh, the guidelines don't recommend uh, you coming to church yet. So we are taking our time and being patient uh, in terms of opening up the church. And uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that we may not be open until uh, September, and that's even if things go well. So please be patient with us. Uh, in terms of announcements uh, today, um, I've got a um, couple of nice announcements. And the first are the flowers here in front of us today are donated, donated by Diana van der Stoel and Javid Summers in honor of their wedding, which is happening in Jasper this evening. So I'm actually leaving after the service, and Fiona and I are going out to Jasper to perform the wedding. Javid is the treasurer of our church. And the other announcement... Uh, that, that I have is this is the time of year uh, for graduation and I know of at least three people from our congregation who are graduating. Olivia Okonkwo is graduating from high school. Kostantin Kashiku of the Kayembe family, he's graduating from high school. And Julia Don Edwards has graduated um, from her, with her Bachelor of Arts uh, from University of Alberta. Um, the graduates from high school will be receiving Bibles. We give Bibles to our high school graduates, and so we'll arrange for them to get bi uh, high um, Bibles. And if you know of anybody I don't know about, please uh, send me an email or give me a call. Uh, we want to make sure that we I'll recognize them next week or at a later date uh, when I find out if there's other high school or university graduates or college graduates that I don't know about. I'm going to light the Christ candle and then go up uh, for the singing of the introit. And our introit today is, What Does the Lord Require of You? 709.
The prayers of approach are printed in the bulletin, and we pray them together in unison. Let us pray. You gather us from our separate lives, great God, to hear your word and respond to your revealing. You have appointed us for the work of your church and to bring in your kingdom. We seek your guidance, your wisdom, your way. Forgive us when instead of bringing in your kingdom, we shut the doors to your kingdom. We preach the bad news to the poor that we are unable to do anything to help. We blind the eyes of the sighted by obscuring your love and grace in trivialities, legalism, and personal agendas. We oppress people more than we free them by forcing people to live our ways and believe our beliefs. We don't announce the time that you will save them, but indicate the time that you will damn them if they don't conform. Forgive us, God, for Jesus' sake, and put your loving spirit in us, that we would truly live like Jesus and be bearers of good news and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. God is love, and Jesus has come to set us free. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
Well, good morning, children of all ages. On the cover of the bulletin today, I have a picture. And the picture is of six-year-old Jordan Smith. Now, a lot of, maybe if you watch the news at all, or maybe you've seen stories and you've heard about the word racism. And racism is when people are not liked or hated or treated poorly because of their skin color, because it's different. And primarily in Canada, that usually me meant that white people have treated people with different colors, especially black people, especially indigenous people, but other people with other color skins too, and they've not treated them the same, not liked them as much, or sometimes even hated them. And of course, a lot of people marching and said, racism is still going on, unfortunately, and we have to do something to stop it. And yes, we are working to stop racism. So the picture I have, and I'll show you again, of Jordan Smith. So on the one side is the, the actual picture of her when she went on a Black Lives Matter walk. And it was a peaceful protest. And someone was so inspired that they drew her picture, um, did a painting of her picture. Because after the walk, she said, it made me feel like a person. And so when the person who painted it, she put over the top of the picture, I am a person. And what I thought was, that's exactly what Jesus came to do, to make us all feel like persons that were valued, that were important, that were loved, that we matter to God and to each other whether you're black or white or whatever skin color you have, whether you're rich or poor, whoever you are, Jesus loves you and you matter to him and he makes you a person of value. Our hymn is 624, Blessed Are They.
responsive psalm is Psalm 69, verses 7 to 18, and we're singing uh, refrain number one. It is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became highward to them. I am the subject of gossip for those who sit in the gate, and, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, rescue me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit fill its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servants, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to me, redeem me. Set me free because of my enemies. Our first scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Hear the word of God. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And our <clears throat> second scripture lesson is from Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. Hear the word of God. 
A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of this household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Praise God for the reading of his word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rescuer, our rock. Amen. Ye powers, who make mankind your care and dish them out their bill of fare. It's a line from Robert Burns' poem addressed to a haggis. It's been said many times over the years in this building, mostly downstairs when we're having church suppers or burn suppers. Ye powers. Paul the Apostle also wrote about ye powers when he wrote, For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The powers. In 1948, George Orwell wrote the novel 1984, which was a dystopian novel, which is to say it's a novel about the future in which the future is not good. It's a warning about the future. And the story of 1984 is about a man named Winston who lives in the fictional totalitarian country of Oceania in which everything's controlled by the government. Everything. There are cameras everywhere watching you. Thus the phrase, Big Brother is watching you. Winston works for the Ministry of Truth where it's not about the truth at all. They constantly rewrite history even declaring some real historical persons as unpersons and deleting them from all history. They can control completely all media, books, magazines, radio, television, etc. So that all anybody gets is the government's propaganda. It's a classic novel which predicted many of the dilemmas, issues, abuses this world faces in this age of communications and mass media, issues such as personal privacy, state security, freedom of information, government, rewriting of history or leaving out parts of history, propaganda, torture, brainwashing. And maybe you've had the feeling sometimes a big brother is watching you. A while back, I was going to get some new Milwaukee M12 tools, M12 tools. And I was looking on Amazon.ca at which tools I might get. And then I noticed that on Facebook, every day I was getting ads for Milwaukee M12 tools. It's just like the band the police used to sing when it comes to the Internet. Every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. Big Brother is watching you on the Internet. Edward Snowden, a former CIA employee, released U.S. state secrets to the world 
and revealed how many illegal things the U.S. government was doing, especially spying on their own citizens, spying on 35 different government world leaders. The NSA was wiretapping phones, emails, internet use of millions of people without authorization. Big Brother is watching you. So one of the powers <clears throat> in this world is government. Of course, government is not just one power. There are many governments, not only around the world because there's many countries, but even in a uh, country there are national governments and provincial governments and city governments. and you know There's lots of different forms of government. But that's not the only kind of powers in this world. And I want to quote from the book, The Powers That Be, written by the late Walter Wink, who I think was a great theologian, a Methodist minister, a professor at Auburn Theological Seminary in New York City for many years, a leading biblical scholar. And he said, or wrote, all of us deal with the powers that be. They staff our hospitals. They sit around tables in corporate boardrooms. They sit in city hall. They collect our taxes, run our churches, head our families. But the powers are more than the people who run things. They are the systems themselves, the institutions and structures that weave society into an intricate fabric of power and relationships. These powers surround us on every side. They are necessary. They are useful. We could do nothing without them. Who wants to live without well-maintained roads or schools or hospitals? But the powers are also a source of unmitigated evil. A while back, there was the mortgage housing crisis in the United States. All kinds of risky mortgages were bundled together and sold as AAA securities. It was crooked and corrupt, and the major financial institutions were a part of it, even though they didn't fully understand the ramifications of what they were doing. Even the credit rating companies were giving good credit ratings to things which were really bad risk debts. This is an example of the powers and the evil that they can cause because when it all came home to roost, the autonomy, economy tanked, millions of people lost their homes, millions of people lost their jobs, but it wasn't the powers who suffered. In fact, the financial powers were bailed out by the government powers in order to keep the whole system afloat because, after all, we need banks and car loans and mortgages and retirement savings. And a lot of the rulers of the financial powers still got bonuses and huge salaries. So in this case, Big Brother was not only watching, it was taking advantage of us. See, here's the thing that Wink Walter Wink wants to say, the powers are fallen, the powers are broken, the powers are sinful. It doesn't mean that they don't do any good or that they don't have the intention to do good. The education system, the medical system, the government, they all say they want good things, but they're not perfect. And when push comes to shove, the institutions, the powers, the system usually looks after itself and looks after the ones in power who control them. And this all gets compounded by the fact that big powers in this world often collude together because they're controlled by a small group of people who are usually white, male, and wealthy. And while they want to keep the world at peace and running smoothly, they do so because it keeps money rolling into their pockets. Walter Brueggemann, another leading biblical scholar, uh, Many people think he's one of our best Old Testament scholars. I personally think he's probably the best living Old Testament scholar who's written many books, was a, uh, for a number of years professor at a Presbyterian seminary at Columbia uh, in Decatur, Georgia, calls this group of privileged white male rich controllers of the powers the hegemony. Let me paraphrase from one of Walter Brueggemann's lectures. The hegemony are the ones in control. They enforce consent with or without armed force. The hegemony wants to keep the things the way they are because it suits them, because it keeps them in power. In the world today, the predominant hegemony is white, male, and rich. There are lots of people who look forward to elections to see that the government changes. And when there's a change of government, there are some changes, but the real truth is this. It might not make 
a lot of difference who was elected at times because it's not always the politicians who run the country. It's the hegemony, predominantly the very rich, who are white and male predominantly. Even if a woman or a black man is elected, the hegemony are still there. And so often the options are to oppose the hegemony or to be part of it. And most leaders are already a part of the hegemony. I took these notes at a, an association of Presbyterian Christian Ader, Educators Conference some 20, 25 years ago. So much today, for instance, is said about systemic racism. That's just one aspect of the system, the powers. And it isn't just that there are people in the system that are racist, and of course there are, but it's more than that. The system itself is biased, and it's biased towards white, heterosexual, privileged, rich males. They're the ones who basically run it and legitimize violence to keep the system the way it is. And armies and police have always been part of the way the system is maintained. Yes, the system changes over the year. And in Canada, it is better than it was. It's better for women and minorities and gays and people with disabilities and the poor than it probably was 50 years ago or 100 years ago, that sort of thing. But it still is a fallen system with its built-in biases. And the system spins narratives to support it. We need lower taxes. We need bigger jails. We need to curb the ability to protest. We need law, law and order. The unions are bad. Socialism is communism. The media produces fake news. The system loves to point fingers at others who are evil, like terrorists, or North Korea, or China. And they're right. There's evil in other places in the world. But the system has a hard time pointing fingers inward and in dealing with systemic poverty, systemic discrimination, systemic racism. Because the truth is, to make changes in the system will reduce the wealth of the rich, reduce the power of the powerful, reduce the privilege of the privileged. And most of us, myself included, are part of the system and often we buy into the system because it's inherent in human nature not to change the system if we benefit. And since the Western world has benefited most, we who live in the Western world often give lip service to the system and don't try to change it too much. One of the interesting things about Jesus is how much of his message was against the system. It was against the powers that be. He talked about setting people free. He talked about the rich being brought low and the poor being raised up. He talked about power and challenged the powers of his day, whom he called tombs, whitewashed sepulchers. They looked pretty on the outside, but were dead on the inside. He talked about nonviolence and non-judgment and justice and equality for all. And Jesus treated all with love and grace and forgiveness and compassion. Now, just think of these words that Jesus said that we read in Luke's gospel. Think of these in terms of systemic racism or systemic poverty. I've come to bring good news to the poor. I've come to bring release to the captives. I've come to bring healing to those who are hurt. I've come to break the chains of those who are oppressed. Jesus has a different way of being. And he invites us into a different way of being. And if this is Jesus' message, and if you read through the Gospels time and time again, you will say, hear Jesus saying, it's not wealth or status or power that counts. It's love and grace and forgiveness and compassion and equality for all. In fact, Jesus said, you know, some groups like to lord it over others. But he told us not to lord it over others, but to serve others, all people. And in today's scripture lesson, there's some jarring words of Jesus that seemed not to, to make sense even. Jesus, in this passage, says he's come to bring a sword. Jesus said he's going to set family member against family member. There'll be strife in our families. Jesus talks about us losing our lives. But the sword that Jesus brings is a sword that got him killed. It's the sword of truth that cuts away at rich privilege, 
and cuts away at the powers that be. It's a sword that cuts the system and demands that all people be treated equally, that all have right to food, to water, to education, to health care, to peace, to housing, and fair treatment. And it's a sword that does cut into families because the basic unit or system in this world is the family unit. And the family you grew up in is often the source of some of our biggest prejudices and biases. And Jesus knows that for us to seek truth and love, we have to fight against a system sometimes, even if that system is our family or our culture or our church or our government. And it will cost us. In order to bring life to the system, we will have to expend some of our life and make sacrifices. Jesus' basic message was that God's kingdom can come on earth, that the way of God's love and equality can come on earth, and we should pray for it to come, and not only pray for it to come, help embody the kingdom. And what is that kingdom? Not a place where a male ruler is ruling. That's not what Jesus means by a kingdom, but a network of relationships governed by love. A place, a system, a condition where love is supreme and that all interactions are guided by the principle of loving your neighbor, that all interactions are about serving and loving the other. What would it be like on this earth if God's love held sway, if Jesus held sway, if God held sway, if the Spirit of God held sway, there would be egality and equality. All people would be considered equal. All people would be treated as children of God. There would be the principle of sharing. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. Sharing with those in need and the poor is part of Jesus' message, but it's more than just sharing with the poor. How about addressing the structures, the cultures, and the institutions, and the system that keeps people poor? Nonviolence. Jesus often spoke about nonviolence because violence has been one of the prime ways that people gain power, hold power, and stay in power. And Jesus told us to abandon that way of getting power, using violence, turn the cheek, forgive those who hurt us. Jesus treated women and foreigners and those of different races in so different than most of the people at his time. He was so far ahead of his time in the way he treated women and minorities, granting them status and quality and treating them as peers. Jesus gave acceptance to those who were considered unacceptable. In those days, it was usually people who were considered unclean. And Jesus showed that he would touch these people and talk to these people and heal these people and minister to these people, that holiness and purity was not about rites and rituals and laws, but about purity of heart, where one had love for another. And all these teachings of Jesus were about relationships of love, not rules and hierarchies and systems. He taught that the powers were fallen, the system is broken, but he tried to redeem it with a new social order, by creating a new family where everyone was equal and everyone was part and everyone was considered one body. And that's why the hegemony killed him. Because in the words of the high priest, it's better that one man die than the hegemony be destroyed. He said whole nation, but what he really meant was the hegemony. You know, for years, people have been writing books about this and talking about this. Why is the organized church going downhill? Why is attendance waning? Why are churches closing? What should we do about it? Why aren't all the young people here? I don't think it's all bad. The church joined the hegemony 1,700 years ago when the church gained real power with the reign of Emperor Constantine. And the church allied itself with the power of the government. And I won't bore you with all the excesses of the church over those years. And no, nor will I say that everything the church did was bad. There were millions and millions of wonderful people in the church. But at times the church allied itself with power and wielded that, wielded that power very brutally at times. 
Even a hundred years ago, most of the hegemony of Edmonton came to First Presbyterian Church, the powerful and wealthy and the people who control things. Were they bad or evil? No more than we are, I suppose. Uh, but we think of back then often as the good old days, the good old days when the church was full. There was a thousand people in church and we had lots of money and those were the good old days, but they weren't necessarily the good old days. If you looked at the history of annual meetings, you'll find out even a hundred years ago, people still didn't think we had enough money to run the church. They always argued about money. But there was things that were really bad. A lot of judgment, a lot of criticizing, a lot of shame. If you were an unmarried woman with a child, if you were gay or lesbian or black or different, you were not welcome and you were often shamed or put down or considered evil. Uh, people who didn't come to church were sh criticized or shamed. The wealthy had better seats, and they ran the session. The poor people sat in the back. There was less humor, less compassion. The church supported the hegemony because the church was part of the hegemony. And we all know about some of the sins of the church over the last hundred years or so. We know about bad priests and bad ministers and how often the system of the church covered up some of those issues, some of those sexual issues. We know about the problem of residential schools. And so maybe part of the decline of the church is it wasn't building a kingdom of love and equality, but it had allied itself with the system. And so maybe... The sword that Jesus is talking about. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Maybe Jesus is cut it, taking out a sword and he's pruning the church. So that we're not part of the system anymore. But a sword of truth. That we can be a sword of truth instead. To challenge the system. Maybe we are pruned back so we can truly be a people of love. Who have loving relationships. Maybe it's not all bad that people don't come to church anymore because they come because their parents told them they had to come or they come because in order to participate in the economic system, you have to go to church. Maybe the church is dying so that we can be resurrected and born again to the church that Jesus envisioned, a body where everyone is equal and everyone is loved. And we give truth and light and peace and wholeness to the world, that we would be a safe place, and especially for the disenfranchised, the people who've endured systemic poverty, systemic discrimination, systemic racism. I don't think the church is supposed to be big brother watching over everything we do, pointing fingers and judging. Jesus invited us to be a family, celebrating one another, enjoying one another, loving one another. And what would that look like if we could just truly love one another? You know, big brother, big sister, they watch, they control, they take advantage, they push their own agenda, they get their own way, no matter the cost. But we can be servants of love, serving others. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray silently, putting our faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we are reminded that Jesus, though he was equal to you, emptied himself of power, humbled himself, and became a servant and was obedient even unto his death. And that was a different kind of power. A power of service and love. And that's the power we want to commit ourselves to. Of being disciples of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn is 87, When God Restored Our Common Life.
Let us pray. God, when the world spins crazy, spins wild and out of control, spins towards rage and hate and violence, spins beyond our wisdom and nearly beyond our faith, God, when the world spins in chaos as it does now among us, we're glad for sobering roots that provide ballast in the storm. We thank you for our rootage in communities of faith, for our many fathers and mothers who have believed and trusted as firm witnesses to us, for their many stories of wonder, awe, and healing. We are glad this day in this company for the rootage of the scriptures, for the, the daring testimony, for its deep commands, its exuberant tales, because we know that as we probe deep into the scriptures, clear to the bottom, we find you there, speaking as you do, governing, healing, judging. And when we meet you in the scripture, we find the spin in the world not so unnerving because from you the world again has a chance for life and sense and wholeness. We pray midst the spinning, waiting and watching and listening, for you are the truth that contains all our spin. We're mindful of those, God, caught, trapped, held, imprisoned by systems of enslavement and abuse, by ideas and ideologies that demean and immobilize, by unreal hopes and ungrounded fears. We know ourselves much of unliberty, too wounded, too obedient, too driven, too fearful. So God, be our massive way of emancipation and let us all be free at last. We dare ask for the middle wall of hostility to be broken down between liberals and conservatives, in government, in the world, in the church, between haves and have-nots, between victims and perpetrators, between all sorts of colleagues in this place and all those arenas besought with violence, rage, and hate. We know we're not meant for abusiveness, but we stutter before our vocation as peacemakers. Transform us beyond our fearfulness, our timidity, our excessive certitude, that we may be vulnerable enough to be peacemakers and so to be truly called your very own children. Our world grows weary of the battering and the vicious cycles that devour us. We seem to have no capacity to break those vicious cycles of anti-neighborliness and self-hate. We turn like our people always have to you, our single source of newness. So, Father, in your mercy, receive us and all our weary neighbors. Remembering Mother, hold us and all our desperate friends. Passionate lover, in your mercy, embrace us and cherish us and cherish our enemies as well. Gift giver, in your mercy, embrace those who are strangers to us who are also your well-beloved children. Make us all together new. Amen. At this time, it's time to uh, take up the offering, and so we thank you again for your continued support, and as Joachim plays some music, we can meditate about, or, no, we're going to have a, we're going to have another anthem. Yeah. You can think about your loving hands and how you can give to people.
Bless, O Lord, these gifts and offerings, that they may be a sign of our intent to serve you. Use them and us to bring good news to the poor and bring wholeness and healing to all who are hurting and oppressed. Amen. Our closing hymn is 585, Christ You Call Us All to Service.
God bless you. God bless you all, and happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.